it's a great video. So hello to everyone. Today we are with Mr. Justin Mott. The name which we, which need no introduction. He is based in Vietnam and doing photojournalism. So just to introduce yourself, then we'll move to a question. Sure. My name is Justin Mott. I'm a photographer, American photographer living in, in Vietnam. I'm 41 years old, soon to be 42. I've been living in Vietnam for over a decade. I run a production company called Mott Visuals, um, and we, we specialize in luxury, uh, luxury hospitality, video, and, and commercial photography. And I have a background as, as a photojournalist for over a decade. I've shot over 100 assignments for the New York Times. I've worked for uh, assignments for National Geographic, for Washington Post, uh, New York Times, Time, uh, Forbes, you name it. I've covered all sorts of different stories around this region, and I also work on personal projects in sort of uh, wildlife photojournalism and conservation photography. So I do a bit of everything. That's good. <laughs> That's good. So today is my partner is Imran Miza from Dubai. Imran, by introduce yourself. So yeah, um, I'm Imran from the UK, and I've uh, moved over to Dubai. I've been living here just for a short while. Um, Let's get into the question. So you just mentioned that, Justin. Um, obviously, thank you so much for coming, and uh, it's, it's a great honor to actually have you here today. Um, you said you, uh, you're, from the, you're from the U.S., and you've moved over to uh, Asia. What was the initial thought process behind that? What was the reason behind that? I mean, you've been there for a decade, so obviously you love the place. Yeah, well, I started in, I started a little bit late in my career. I started in my late 20s studying photojournalism at um, San Francisco State University. I fell in love with, with sort of the career, the idea of the career in photojournalism. Um, got really caught up in, in school. I love photographing different stories in San Francisco. And a year before I was about to graduate, I took a trip to Vietnam just to do some, uh, a little bit of uh, soul searching and a little bit of uh, my own personal photography projects. And Really, that was 2005, and I never really came back. I never finished college. I don't recommend that for people, but I had a year left in school, but I found myself uh, enthralled with, with a lot of the stories here, with a lot of uh, just taking my camera and going for a walk. I was, I was inspired. Uh, I went on all these little trips outside of uh, – I, I was living in Hanoi for a little bit, but I, I traveled throughout the country. I fell in love with the people, fell in love with, with, with photographing here, and honestly, I might have gone back a few times after that, back and forth, but I never really – that was the point that I kind of officially moved to Vietnam, and I really started my career out in Vietnam. And I started it, um, I really started with the New York Times, actually. Well, that's amazing. I mean, because you obviously had a really successful career being where you are already. Um, so you must have really felt some, some love and some passion to say, I, I really like this place. I want to settle down here and actually stay for a decade. It's a long time. Uh, I mean, I'm, yeah. I've tried doing it two years here in Dubai at the moment, and I'm kind of struggling just a wee bit, but I guess these are the struggles you face. How how was it for you when you first initially went? Sure. I mean, did you already know it's going to work, or did you well, like, uh... Yes, yeah, see, I, I would say your struggle is normal. I, I went through the same process. The first few years are hard because you're building contacts, you're building content from, from that region, stories. Um, a body of work, a portfolio, and so it is a struggle. But for me, it was, listen, I wasn't talented in school. I did okay. I, I did a workshop in Asia. I was probably the worst out of 10 people. And then a decade later, I'm probably the only one out of those 10 people. I think I am the only one out of 10 people who's a professional <laughs> photographer. So it was more just about hard work. I told myself, listen, I love photography. I like everything yeah. about photography. Yes, I love journalism, but I'm going to make this a career. I'm going to make it happen. And it wasn't a matter of, of Oh, like, is it going to happen? I just knew it would. I didn't know at, at what level or, yeah. or, or what to expect, but I was I just decided I'm going to make this happen as a career, and I'm not going to give up until I can make a living off of it. And so Vietnam was a great place to start. There was a lot going on. The economy was developing quite a bit. Um, it's, it's a cheap country to live in, so it didn't cost a lot to, to get by for your daily expenses. So the interesting thing about Vietnam is it also allowed me to have a very um, – diverse skill set photography because you have to do a little bit of everything here. If, if I was on a shoot, a commercial shoot in the United States, I would probably be the photographer and that's it. But I found here quickly, it's changed a bit. But when I first started here, I had to be my own producer, my own assistant, my own creative director, my own art director, and my own representative of my own work. So I learned a lot very, very quickly here. And yeah, things just sort of steamrolled after that. My first few years was doing assignments. Again, like I said, with the New York Times, they're a big name so that that helped me. I, I leveraged that work, or at least 
I used that work to get my name out there and I, and I earned it. You know, I did enough stories where I felt like, okay, I can, I can promote myself as, you know, a photographer that does work for the New York Times because I wasn't just doing work in Vietnam for them. I was going to Australia, I was going to Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Laos, Thailand, all over the place. So, you know, once I had that, that really opened up a lot of doors for me, not just editorially, but in commercial photography as well. So yeah, obviously you have these big names and big brands under your belt, so they've obviously helped you excel and really accelerate. Um, it's a massive bonus as to what anyone would, anyone would probably have moving moving to a new location. So, you know, you just mentioned where you were doing all the, you know, production and styling and basically you, you, were, you, you wore many hats as you started off. Was that challenging or was, I mean, what's the main reason? Was it because perhaps there weren't many people able to do that for you or was it you felt more comfortable doing it yourself? No, it was budgets and it was expectations. You know, if you go on a shoot in the United States, if I worked with my agency that I that I worked with there, they would let's, let's say for example, um, if I ran a if I ran a shoot through my agency in New York, and I said, okay, someone came to me, but I'll let my agency handle it, we would always lose the bid because they would bid for you know production assistant, they would bill for everything, and and while that's great, it's not realistic out here, and it's that's the American market and the Asian market at that time wasn't ready for that. So I realized, okay, I have to do these jobs myself. I have to learn how to be able to do everything myself and we've grown since then to a, to a big staff now and but it took time so it was more out of just necessity I said okay if if you can't do this we'll find someone else who can and if you can't do it for this price we'll find someone else who can so I had to find that sweet spot and everything was the wild west for me I had to learn okay what's the pricing what what can I bill for you know what can I what can I not bill for but maybe put my you know my day rate a little bit higher or maybe I'm going to show up and they're not going to they, they say they're going to have an art director but I'm going to have to do everything and that's kind of what happened in the beginning for many years that that really so sounds I learned like... also how to commercialize medicine yeah and you have to in a non-condescending way you have to sort of educate the market too you know for me I had yeah. to say listen for this level of shoot and for your expectation this is what I need you know I, I would I would need if you if you don't have a budget for me to provide this, this is what I need you to provide. And, you know, I think a lot of people will, will get defensive as a photographer's uh, mind about it. And I always would try to, you know, at least have a conversation or dialogue about it so that people would understand what's expected. When, because a lot of times people aren't being mean. They just don't know. A lot of, most of the time people, it's their first photo shoot or their first big budget photo shoot. So you just have to have a, con a conversation. I think a lot of photographers make that mistake of actually, you know, getting turned off right away and saying, listen, I, I'm overvalued. Sure, we can have that conversation amongst each other, but I don't like to have it with clients and scare them away either, because a lot exactly. of times it's a learning process for them too. It is. I mean, you made a very, very good point there. This is something that I always try to tell clients as well, and other photographers actually in the UK as well, where you have this, you have, they have this fear that how do I build them and billing them, or they get, always get scared when I build them too much, you go, well, you have to define or explain because like you just said, they're really, really, really well. The, the client or the customer doesn't always know what's included or how it actually works. They just, all they know is that they want a finished product, which is an image of whatever the product is. They don't actually yeah. know that there's something behind it. So I used to do a lot of um, food photography and product photography um, and for, for the chain of restaurants. And with the food photography at the start, I was able to do a lot myself because I was learning. Hence, it helped me keep my, my price low. But then as I grew a really good rapport with them, it helped me to say, guys, do you want to try something different and make it a little bit better? Since you're opening a new branch, let's try to do something different in terms of your photography, but not the style itself. Just just sure. open it up a bit. And they were like, yeah, but how can we do that? I go, look, I know a stylist. We can try to get the person in. And then it was trying to explain to them what a food stylist is. Because when you try to tell somebody a food yeah. stylist, they don't seem to get how do you dress food? Right. You just pour in the food? You go, well, no, not really. You have to dress yeah. it up in a certain yeah. way. Um, so these are the sort of It's the same with hot hot hotels as well. It's it's the same. So, we, you know, for hotels, we run into the yeah. same process. We have pre-openings pre that are not open yet, and they need a big shoot. And I say, okay, well, who's going to bring the props, right? If we're going to do that, we need to bill you for that. Yeah. And, you, you know, you don't need to be my, – my thing, what happened, what, why we grew so quickly was I saw an opening that – Listen, ad agencies were coming in and they were charging crazy amounts of money for this stuff. And I thought, listen, I think I could build a team that can handle this. And ad agencies are doing such different shoots. But if we're specializing in hotel photography, luxury hotels and resorts, we can build a team that can do the work that an ad agency can do a lot cheaper. And we're, we're not we're not trying to 
we're not trying to you know make a ton of money and, and build them for every little thing, but we are trying to build them for things that they need, or at least set set realistic expectations, which are okay. If you don't have props, does the hotel have props? Do you have someone from your marketing team that understands the brand well? Do you want me to do that? Do we need to bring someone else on the shoot? Do you have models? And if you have a model, who's handling those contracts? Are we handling them or are you handling them? And if you're handling them, then you know you need. To, this is what I would suggest. So it. I think a lot of photographers make that mistake because they get turned off right away because it, it, it can come off very thing when a client doesn't know that and they expect you. To, it, it, you know, I understand I can I can sympathize with being insulted, but at the same time, you're not going to get anywhere if you react sort of, you know, brashly. So you have to you have to have just have, have an open conversation with them. I found too, like right away with clients, like when I talk about budget, oh, people get uncomfortable. But you know what? That weeds out clients that can't don't have the budget for us. And maybe I can. Point them in the right direction, and no one has to be insulted. No one has to waste time because building a big quote for a big shoot takes a lot of time and a lot, and a lot of effort. So you know that it's just having a having a conversation, not being afraid, of money, not being afraid to just be open and, and transparent, and you know it, it gets you pretty far because you weed out the ones that don't that have you know stumbled upon you incorrectly, and then you also weed that out with your marketing and and with your work as well. It just takes time. It's all about effective communication, really, isn't it? Just making sure everyone's on the same page and everyone's communicating effectively. Nothing's yeah. being lost in translation, and you know everyone understands exactly what they need. Um, I did a shoot here not so long ago for a fashion agency, and they the problem we had was that they actually had plenty of money, and they all they they just all they kept on saying was, "Imran, we need this finished product. We need this finished product." That's all there was, and there was nobody else on their team. It was literally one person who was like. Just give me all this. I go, okay, how are we doing this for the models? And, you know, I try to really break it down like I normally would, just exactly how you just said. But they actually took it the wrong way in a sense where they were like, look, can you do this or not? I was like, okay. I added yeah. it all up, put a bit extra on top, just in case I went a bit over or under. I told them the price. They said, right. okay, let's get it done. And then we got it done, gave them a breakdown. And I think they actually got some spare change, which they actually let me keep. Which I was, I was like, this is a first in my whole career. Right. I mean, yeah. Me and you were both similar ages, and I was like, <laughs> I have never had this in my life. And they just gave it to me. I was like, wow, this is amazing. I think yeah. it's so, so good. It's a rare, um, a lot of times people just don't. I just felt it was better and for people me. People aren't just being mean for the sake of being mean, they just don't know sometimes. They just don't know exactly, and you have to understand, like, with, with, with people here, they, they speak in a different manner because of the culture is a bit different. And you have to learn to respect that sure. and understand that. That's the, that's the only thing. They're not. They are how they are because that's just how they brought up to be. So because we're in their land, it kind of becomes our responsibility to try to communicate with them in their way, how they prefer, not the other way around. So you know, I, I tried. It took me about a week to get the contract, and I was at times getting frustrated because I really didn't understand how they wanted me to play. And again, it came sure. back to the quotation game. How do I quote this to them? What do I quote them? What if it's under? How am I going to ask them again? It doesn't look professional. I go, you know what? Do it. Put them a bit higher. Enough where I know I can cover everything. So then you change. We'll give it back. Show them how good we are. And let's see how it works. And I think it paid back. Honestly, paid back. And like I said, they let me keep it. Uh, it paid about it paid for about, about third, uh, about towards about a third for my new lens, which which broke. So I, I kind of had a bit of money for that. So I went out and bought that the next day. Well, yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't know too many photographers that have made a lot of money off of of, of being, you know, mean and <laughs> in response to an email. It's, it's not mean. It's you know, I, I, I don't I don't know too many that have landed the jobs. It's an ego trip, really, isn't it? You know, That's what, what it is. They think that you know. It is, know and I think I think our industry is is filled with that. And I think I think people that aren't end up getting a lot of work because I think the you know a lot of famous photographers have gotten away with an ego, but a lot of them, you know, that's a rarity. That's the one percent. I think the rest of the rest of us have to have to hustle. You have to find what yeah. your niche is and you have to find out what, what clients need. And for us, when I went on our first big shoot for Intercontinental Hotels, I mean they're a huge brand. They're one of the biggest hotel brands in the world. And we're one of a handful of, of you know officially approved photographers for them. And what I noticed when I went on a shoot with an ad agency was, first of all, the ad agency was making, um, I, I would say I was making 10% of what the ad agency was making, but myself and my assistant at the time were doing about 80 to 90% of the work, and it just didn't make sense to me. I thought, well, we can do that. Why shouldn't we be making that money? Because we, we're doing everything. They were just there, you know, massaging the client and dealing, you know, b pretending to, to do stuff, and they weren't really doing much. So. For us, it was like, listen, I can, after that shoot, Intercontinental noticed that we were working hard. They noticed that we handled a lot of stuff. They noticed 
wow, maybe this guy can do it on his own. And rather than, you know, talking behind their back or creating gossip, I just put my head down. They were creating problems that didn't exist. And I, I hustled and my assistant hustled and we did a good job. And they approached me after the shoot and said, hey, could you do a video? And if you can, could you handle the models? And at the time, I didn't have a lot of experience with that. But you know what? I said, listen, I can figure it out. We can figure this out together. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I was transparent with them. Like, I haven't done this before, but I feel like I can. I feel like we, you know, we can charge a lot less than the ad agency is going to charge. And I feel like we can, we can have an honest dialogue together about the creative process and come up with something. I felt very confident in that because the outcome for, for the, the, the final concept for the video and the photography was really my vision, not the ad agency's vision. So if you're paying for creative, that's a waste of money because I was doing it. And we, we did it. We had our chance. We had our shot at it. And we, I, I felt we did a great job. And they felt we did a great job. And from there, we've done over, I don't know, 30 hotels from them and probably over 40 to 50 shoots for them around the world. So it, it really worked out well. It was kind of just taking a chance and saying, listen, I, I, you know, I'm being realistic. But I, I, at the time, I, was, I didn't know if we could do it. But I, uh, well, I hadn't done it. But I felt confident that we could pull it off. And, and we did. And that's. That's kind of how you make your, your name and that's how you get work in a commercial world. I also knew how to talk about it in a way and, and, and sell it in a way and market it in a way that was different because my background was doing editorial work and I wanted to bring a style to Angel Continental that was more of an editorial style. So I told them that and that was a chance for me, but I knew, listen, this is different. Every hotel photographer is doing things the same way. It's still going to be toned and the, you know polished commercially in a, in a commercial way, but the style of it's going to be very natural. The models will look natural. The moments will be natural and the toning, it's not going to be like o overly done. And they really like that. And the great thing was, is as a photographer, I can talk about that way better than your average ad agency person can. So I know how to talk about these things and it's not just talking about, it. I believe it and I meant it and they, they could feel that. And that's, that's kind of how we landed that, that big job. And then for me, that built the confidence to sort of land other clients. I think that basically comes from being able to explain it well, because you're actually doing it yourself. You know your capability. You know the re you know the reality of it. When it comes to an ad, ad agency, don't get me wrong, but they are kind of consist of like salesmen, salespeople, so to speak. They're not not all sure. of them necessarily are working photographers or professionals. So they may un you know over promise something, which then comes back to the photographer, and then it's like no, but we said this, and you're like well, but it doesn't work like that, and they're like well, can you not do it? Again, it, yeah. it becomes tricky. So I mean, the way you handled that was amazing. So as we just as we just saw that, we're sharing some of your. Um, I'll just put it back on again, where we were just having okay. a look at your um, impressive, impressive list of um, clients. I mean, you got you got your Intercontinental there. You've got your North Face. I mean, everyone is familiar with all these worldwide brands. You know, Reebok, uh, Unilever. Um, you know, WWF. Obviously, everybody knows that. Uh, Time and then CNN, BBC, <laughs> hail BBC, Nike or Nike, whichever way you want to say it. Um, <laughs> I want to come back. To you talk, you you talk a lot about um, your humble beginnings, how you started off in a small cafe, and then now obviously you set up in, is it three, three or four different cities, and you know you've got ever expanding team. How how was it in the start? How how was the growth, and how how did you get from that small place to getting your first major client? And the feeling you had when you got that first big client, how was it? Yeah, well, 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 two big moments for me was my first assignment for the New York Times. That was sort of like a validation for my career because they're such a big brand, not not just in the United States, but worldwide. And for me, going to school for photojournalism, that, that was a big moment for me, you know, and that, it felt great. You know, I still have the frame picture I'd show you, but I had to switch my office today. I went down to my, I left my home office, but in my, my home office, because we had construction, my home office, I have a, a printed, uh, a friend of mine printed out the, my first cover for the New York Times. It was my first assignment. So that was a big deal for me because when I went to school, that was where I wanted to be. That's, that's the publication I wanted to get in, in with. So that for me was validation for my, for my career and, and, and like, okay, I can hang with these people. I can do this kind of work. And it was, I was living in Vietnam, but the assignment was in Malaysia and it was a hard story to get access to. So it was a combination of just my, my portfolio, my hard work, the work I, I've done in my my personal, my personal projects, and then just making it all come together. And I worked with a seasoned writer on that shoot, and you know he is very familiar with this region. I was new out here, but I'm the one that helped get access. And it was, it was really just you know, grinding it out, getting access, not giving up. You know, New York Times is a kind of publication. You you can't come back and say, oh, I didn't get the shot or I didn't get access. You have to mm -hmm. find a way, and I did find a way. So that was a big moment for me in my editorial career. And then years later, with the commercial work. 
the big moment for me was doing that shoot with an ad agency. And the break for me was realizing, okay, shooting for Intercontinental was, was interesting, but I always thought you had to go, I was taught like you had to go photographer, ad agency, and then, you know, the client and the ad agency is this and the photographer is this. And then on the shoot, I just realized like, listen, I wasn't that impressed with them. I found they were creating more problems. They were creating more work that had to be done. And I thought, oh, wow, I can do this myself. And my experience with the New York Times of getting access and, and doing things in a really difficult, stressful environment, high pressure environment, it, they really extended over into my, into my commercial work because I felt, okay, this is not nearly as stressful as getting access to this factory in Bangladesh where after they had a fire and they, I'm the only foreigner and I'm trying to figure out my way in or covering you know, this uh, tragedy that happened in Cambodia after, uh, after a stampede happened. Like that stuff was really hard to emotionally, really hard access wise, really hard uh, technically and stylistically that the commercial work was like, okay, enough to say it's easy, but it was just, it was a lot less stressful. And I realized, oh, I can, I can handle this stuff. And I can, I can just, the stuff that they could do, it's, they're just polishing it, but I can, I can achieve that. So when I did my first shoot for, for uh, Intercontinental video and stills without an ad agency involved, that gave me the freedom to say, wow, well, the confidence to say, I can do this without them. And then also, obviously, you're making more money off of that shoot because you're handling everything. And you have control over the output, which I felt confident about. And when it was a success, that was a great, a great moment for me in my career. It's very interesting. You just said um, about feeling, feeling emotional about you know, being able to do it, uh, about the disasters that happened. I'm going to just ask you, I mean, it might seem like a weird question, but what, what do you mean by the emotional side of it? Are you talking about emotionally being able to do the actual job in itself, or is it just an impact it had on you personally, not necessarily related to the photography side of things? Because um, I'll give an example. What? is The reason I probably wouldn't myself um, cover anything like what you, you know yourself is, I don't think I'm emotionally strong enough to, from a photography side of view, to pick a camera up and actually capture it. For me, it's too overwhelming. I, I, I can just mainly, I'm, I'm a big softie. You know, I see, <laughs> I see stress. I personally, honestly, I start, I start crying. It really it gets to me. Uh, and never, never mind trying, you know, I'll be thinking of, of figuring out ways of trying to help the situation rather than trying to reach out for my camera and trying to document it. Um, and in, I mean, a famous one is I forgot the photographer who actually committed suicide um, when he had the vulture on the child. And sure, yeah, about. Sure. Yeah, I forgot his name. Yeah. I mean, again, he decided, and then later on, you know, he couldn't live with his action. And I can see it's it's really, really, really strong. The emotion is so strong. How do you how do you overcome that? How do you how do you manage and say, I'm going to do this? Is it do you have to kind of like block it out or put a different hat on? Yeah, I, well, first of all, I, I think it's a you know misconception that people say like, oh, you, you can't be a human in those situations. You have to be a purist. I think photographers like to embellish on that. I think they like to, to give themselves an excuse or say they have to do that. I mean, I, I'm a human. If I was in a situation where I could help someone and get the picture, I, I, I'm going to help someone. You know, I, I, even, even something as simple as, you know, we can get into that later, but my personal project, I, I flew mm -hmm. from Vietnam to Suriname in South America, halfway around the world on my own money to photograph a lady that takes care of sloths. And it wasn't life or death, but she needed me to help her take the slop and capture it, like uh, rescue the slop from the tree. And she needed my assistance. And I flew all the way there with it, the, not even knowing if I'd even get to see a slop because her rescues happen once or twice a week. And I was there for a week. So, you know, even those situations, it's OK to be a person. It's OK to, to, to you know, maybe get the shot and then also help someone. If it's life or death, I'm going to help someone emotionally. Yes, of course, it's, it's hard to, to deal with you know, tragedy. For me, I can compartmentalize it. I, I don't know if that's a good thing or bad thing, but you never hide from it. You always see those images. So you're always looking, any photographer is looking through their portfolio. They're looking at their website. They're going back to their work constantly. Or any good photographer is, you're checking out your work. So it stays with you. It lives with you. And, you know, if you, it, it doesn't, but that that's kind of what we signed up for when you do that kind of work. That's part of it. But, you know, I do a mix of things. I think for a while, it, it was emotionally difficult for me. I think when I did, when I covered tragedy, I didn't do, I, I didn't cover crazy stuff. I didn't, I didn't cover war. I covered some, I've, I've photographed death before. It's, you know, it, it's, it's hard to be there. It's hard to find what's, what's right. It's hard to decide if you, if you're doing the right thing in the situation, you have to trust your gut and trust your instinct and, you know, follow your moral compass. And I, I've always, 
I've always felt that I have, and you know, maybe I've missed a shot or two. I don't know, but I, I always I, I feel mm-hmm. good about the way I covered different things. And to your point, some of the stuff that's hard for me, and to transition it later into my other work, is the hard part for me is, uh, of course, I love humans and I would help humans, but I have a hard time watching animals. I always feel so helpless, you know, yeah. if I can't help them. So that led to me doing my personal project because. I, I sort of hid from that stuff for a long time. Even stories about animals I wouldn't take on because I always felt like I would get I would get sad and I would get angry. Those two emotions are, aren't you know, and I don't I don't know if I could have been a good journalist in those situations because I wouldn't you know, bear bile farms in, in Vietnam or, or you know, uh, rhino rhino dealer. I've I've done stuff like that. I photographed mafia dealers that sell rhino horn and tiger tiger bones and it makes me angry. I you know, I wanna I wanna turn the guys in or I wanna fight them and and stop them and be a crusader in that. But I did hide from that for a long time. And this project is me getting back to that kind of work that is meaningful to me and, and that I'm passionate about. And so that that's kind of what led for me to start my project, Kindred Guardians, because I, I felt, OK, I've hid from this too much. I'm emotional about animals. Instead of hiding from that, why don't I harness that and put it into something I care about and love, which is photography and storytelling and animal welfare. I think I think nearly every single what you've just said there sums it up in that one picture there so beautifully. That is so powerful and so amazing. I mean, you can see on the screen that I'm sharing. Uh, I think you can see it, right? The, the, the yeah, thank you for saying also, that. That is just phenomenal. I'm telling you, I'm. Oof, wow, I'm lost for words. Oh, thank that. you. Seriously, I'm lost for words. On that. that is. How can you? Oh, this is this is great. This is amazing, Justin. It seriously is. I mean, obviously, I'm not saying the rest aren't, but you know, everything you, <laughs> everything you talked about, you know, the love and the passion and how you're using that. And, you know, I think what you've done is you, you managed to harness all that and then bring it out in the camera to show that's how it's been channeled out in that kind of way, which is something it's kind of difficult because, again, for me, so I wouldn't be able to, but you've done it so well there. Um, this is obviously your personal website, which talks about your personal stuff, which we'll come back to in a second because sure. um, that is just that is just something in itself. I mean, that probably deserves us its own session, actually. Um, yes. Well, can I just to interrupt because it's something I never get a chance to get to. I always forget to get to it. But I think a lot of photographers make the mistake that they say, well, you know, if you're going to do this sort of editorial work or personal work and meaningful work, that kind of stuff that you can't do the other work. And I always think that's that's a bad way to look at it because mm-hmm. photographers are afraid that if you do wedding work, oh, then you're not a good documentary yeah. photographer. And, you know, in this day and age, if you love photography and you want to make a living out of it and make, you know, as you get older, it, it, it got to work, right? So I, I think you can, you, I absolutely think that's false. You can do everything. You know, I've shot weddings, I've shot hotels, I've shot assignments, and I've shot personal work. And it, it, there's, there's nothing wrong with doing those things. Sure, people want to group you in one. You know, if you're, if you're doing wedding work, then the photojournalists want to say, well, he's not a purist. Who cares? You know what I mean? You do your work, your work will speak for itself. And whatever you're passionate about, and you know, if you liked it, if you just want to shoot black and white documentary projects, you know, good luck to you financially. It's going to be difficult. It's not impossible, but it's difficult. So I think people are worried that you know you're going to be grouped in one one category or another. But if you just put your creativity and your passion for one into the other stuff, and you have a pure love for photography, it can be just as much fun and financially, you know, give you the freedom to do stuff that you like too. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, this just like you, you will you, you will have probably heard of the the, uh, the term when they say um, jack of all trades and master of none, <laughs> which yeah. I strongly disagree with because for me it, again, <laughs> I totally stand and totally and totally agree with what you've said. I mean, you've got a very good genre, you've got a very good mixture of stuff here. You know, FAB, portraits, drones, fashion, everything. You know, you've done it all and you've done it all well. This speaks for itself. And I guess it also helps you, it keeps on, it keeps on your toes because, like you know, with portraits, there's a different kind of mindset behind these as to when you're shooting food or when you're shooting architecture. So it's always a, like a learning curve as well. You're always doing something different and something new. Um, and it, and like it, it yeah. helps you move forward. Is this something that you, you do yourself? I mean, when, you, when you've done, how do you decide on some projects? Do, do you take them as they go along or do you decide on what you might feel like doing? For me, I mean, for me, it's, it's a bit like when I'm doing wedding photography, I like to always implement flash. And then when I'm editing the pictures for the next, you know, two, three weeks, because I'm in that kind of flashy mood, I like to start doing other stuff like portraits, but I like to incorporate flash. And then I like to do 
um, products because I'm incorporating Flash and I'm also learning and doing all this as well at the same time. I'm in that kind of zone, if that makes sense. I won't just break yeah. out and then go to something different. Does that kind of like, do you, does that kind of level up with what, you're, what you might do or is it something totally different? Do you, can you one day do yeah, this and then I, do something else and then straight away you do something else? For me, the, the big transition for me was saying in my editorial work, so I, I was, the, the way I sort of got into that was I was doing so much travel work for Condé Nast Traveler, which is a luxury travel brand covering hotels yeah, and resorts. It's, it's kind of like a, a, any photographer finding, finding, you know, finding their moment and capitalizing on it when, when it, when it shows itself and it doesn't always, and then, you know, or, and being diverse. So, but I was doing New York Times travel stuff, which is shot in one way. Condé Nast was a lot, like I mentioned before, like a lot more polished, a lot more luxury. You could have models come in, you could direct a little bit. And I, I said, okay, I can do that. New York Times is very natural. You know, you had to be ethical. You had to just shoot things exactly how it was. And I found myself, oh, okay, I can combine those two styles. And then why, why can't that be something that people want commercially? If these giant magazines are running it, telling, you know, telling stories for a bigger audience or the biggest audiences in the world, you know, National Geographic Traveler and Connie Nast Traveler and New York Times, like, why wouldn't these people want to buy that stuff for their websites? And they did. And they, you know, if you talk to them and explain it to them and they see it, and, and they liked it because I, I started to say, like, listen, I'm going to shoot this with natural light. So all, all my, my background in photography was shooting with natural light and, and finding natural moments. Obviously, hotels, I'm doing some stuff with lighting, but most of it in the beginning, most of my lifestyle stuff for hotels and resorts was natural light. Or I put models in situations where I just hang out, have a drink uh, in this area. We'll set everything up style. Just do as you would. Hang out, talk, you know, play with the, the kids, the kid child models and all that. And then I'm just going to shoot it. And I would overshoot or I shoot with two cameras. So. I, there, there's an influence of my documentary work into my commercial work, and each one of these things that I learn, each discipline in photography, I take something to the next, you know? So commercially, I'm finding new things, I'm practicing new things, even weddings, you know? A wedding, weddings people sometimes knock them, but weddings is like the ultimate culmination of like all, all the disciplines in photography. You have to be able to shoot portraits, you have to be able to shoot, you know, reportage style, you have to be able to shoot, you know, wide yeah. setup yeah. shots, detail shots, everything so I, I just the the mistake you can make as a photographer saying well i like doing this but i also do this and then you don't put as much effort into the stuff that you're just doing when you yeah. pay for the reason clients would come back to me is because even though i love doing you know documentary and stories that i just want to do i put the same effort same passion and same professionalism into my other work and that i think you know i i hope that shows and i think clients can feel that and clients can feel the opposite you know if you're if you're on a shoot and you think you're above it or you're just doing it for the money or you're doing weddings but you don't want to be there like that's not fair to the people that are paying for you and people will see that you'll show it and it'll show in your work too yeah definitely i totally agree with you on that one i mean the reason that i mean what you just said there is really good because he says the reason you're doing all this is not it's not because of the sake of it it's because not only do you enjoy doing it you know you're actually good at it as well and then it shows in the end result people can see that he can take a really good glass of wine or uh, a picture of a glass of wine or a bottle of wine or whatever it is for products. And he also can take really, really good wedding or portrait images. And at the same time, whenever he's doing these shoes, he's actually in the zone. He's enjoying it. He's really taking his time. He's, he's really thinking about this. And it shows in the, in the end result, uh, as we've seen in some of your images there. Um, I'm just going to just talk a little bit about your video work uh, that just in. I mean, I'm just sure. looking at these thumbnails and the lighting is just phenomenal. You mentioned you're using a lot of natural light in, uh, yeah, in, in some of always. your work. Is that, <laughs> is that the same when it comes to video work as well? Or are you trying to look for it? Is, I mean, when we talk about natural light, sometimes people just think that he's only doing it because, I mean, you've heard the saying, a natural light master is somebody who can't use flash. Again, I totally disagree. <laughs> you use it, it's available, right? Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, I used to get slapped for it all the time, but the reason I like using flash is because it's, I can control the light better. Again, that's just my personal preference. But if you get natural light that looks as good as this thumbnail, why are you going to go through the headache of trying to recreate it? It's already available. So in, this, in, in the video work, do you implement the same sort of mentality and thinking, or would you introduce a way you think you need it? We do, and I, I can't even take credit for all of our video work. I've, I've, we have a great cinematographer that I work with. We co-direct stuff. Even some of the stuff now he can direct on his own. In the beginning, I worked directly with, with him. We've had different directors, but I wanted to implement. My thing with video was 
listen, I know my limitations. That's a, what you can do as a photographer if you want to grow into a business is partner up with people that have skill sets that you're not great at. You know, some of our commercial work is tone. We, 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 in the beginning, I used to do it myself, but there was a limitation on what I could do and what I wanted to learn. So then I would outsource and manage and, and sort of direct the way the person would tone it. The same thing happened with video is I thought clients are going to want, this is an opportunity for me to get two jobs in one. I already have them as a photography client, so why not sell them on the video too? And so in the beginning, I did shoot a lot of video, but then I started to say, okay, listen, we can keep that same style, the way I want to shoot with natural light. And then I, I'm also, I'm not so egotistical in that way. I worked with a great, a great director and a great, like I said, a great cinematographer. I said, you know, also put your stamp on it too. So you'll see our video matches my photography in a lot of ways because we did a ton of shoots of just, just photography in the beginning for a lot of these resorts. But then I worked... I worked with someone who knew video well and edited it well, and I would oversee how they would shoot, and I wanted them to match some of my shots. And, you know, sometimes we can double up, and it's an advantage because I might have, you know, four days on the still part of the shoot, and then we do four days in the video, but I've already got these shots in my mind that I could tell to this person. And, and so we wanted that style to match, and it makes sense for a brand too, right? When you bring in a separate video team, the style could be different, not, not just the mm -hmm. style of the cinematography, but the styling of the models and all that. So we use the same models, the same look, everything, and it's done with natural light. So I wouldn't hire a director or a cinematographer that's not great with natural light. So I, I've always recruited people. We have a few we work with now. Um, and and I, I, I need, I look for people that are great at shooting with natural light and that are okay and not so egotistical to implement my style. But I also, I want them to put their stamp on it too. So it's worked out quite well for us. But yeah, natural light, I, I, I disagree. You know, people say, yeah, it's people that don't understand flesh. It's just the way that I like to see things, and it's just the way that I like things to unfold. It's the same with my photography. I like natural light. Even my commercial work, it's weird for clients because I'm not bringing a lot of lights. I don't have a uh, conceptualized shot in my mind already, and that does work well for some people. I'm not knocking that, but it just doesn't work well for me, and it presents a different style and look for our clients, which I think is hard to, to copy. I think it's a little bit easier to copy lights when you can sort of reverse engineer it, but for us, we're saying, okay, Five o'clock, I love that light for resort. I like that color. There's thought that goes into it. So we're, we're up at 4.30. We're ready to shoot at 5, 5.30. And we're getting 90% of our stuff in the first two hours of the day and the last two hours of the day. And that might seem cliche to some people to say, but really it works that way for us. We're getting all of our best stuff in, our, in that time. We, we explain that to the client thoroughly. They, we make them understand so everything is set and ready to go. And we, we, build, you know, we, we sort of build in a couple extra days to make sure that we get the light exactly how we want it so we can deliver the product that we feel good about. But yeah, it's all natural light. So each shoots a lot. It's, it's a lot different. It's a little bit harder for people to copy us, which is a, you know, big problem, any, any market, any part of the world. That's what they do. It's true. I mean, I love what you said at the start where, um, you like to, you know, you like to kind of get another team on board with videography or whatever. You're not one of those persons who says, Oh, look, he's doing all of this. Why don't I try to do it all? And, get all the money or get all the benefit for it. I think that's a, a yeah. common mistake a lot of people make. They try to be a true, I mean, those are probably the, tr the true the true, jack of all trades, but they're not even that because it's like, I can do some videography, but I'm going to pretend I can do it all because I'm going to take it all and it's all me, me, me. And then again, it's just ego boost really, isn't it? Um, I mean, looking at these, I'm oh, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but it, it is still our team. I don't hire a separate team. Our, our team does produce the entire video. No, we, yeah, but we, I like to work with fellow, fellow best creators, too. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the, best, the best photographer is doing the photography, the best videographer is doing the videography, and the best guy, you know, you're, you're maximizing the benefits of what these people can do. And, you know, you work better that way as a team as well. Uh, just let them yeah. carry on doing what they're doing, and you all, you know, you all got the same hat on, you all working up the same page. So it makes so much more sense, and it's the best way of doing it. I mean, you can see how everything... Uh, Flows very similar in all of these videos. You've got the same kind of style behind them. You know the way they've been shot, the way yeah. the way the editing is, the way the grading is. It's all very very similar. You can tell it's been done by the same team, um, which is really, yeah, really and good. Like, and you were right. It's not it's not for ego. It's it's well, the reason I want to do that. The reason I want them to mimic my style for the photography for these resorts is because we have actually had a say in the brand styling for Intercontinental, for the look and feel that we're doing. So I've helped sort of create that. And so I've helped create it for photography. Why not? It works well for their brand to have it sort of extend over into their video work as well. So they love it. And it lands us. It lands, most of our shoots these days are dual shoots. We are doing stills and we are doing, we're doing video. It's like 90% of our shoots are like that these days.
So they're getting uh, the full package, so to speak. They're not having to shop around and mess about. So you manage to tell that to the client that, you know, yeah, same understand. models and everything gets better. You know, even even we have a nice advantage is if, you know, I, the director I work with now, I have so much trust in him that he can set up the shot or we can set it up together. And then we can even double up because, you know, say we did stills on a Tuesday and the light was so-so. Again, a lot of our stuff is really dependent on light. So we plan time, mm -hmm. we plan time of the year, we look at all that stuff. But everything's been set up nice. But say for the stills part, it didn't go that well. I have another opportunity if we're doing a similar scene by the pool or by the beach or you know, a destination shot when we also do photography. So we have a great advantage in, in that too. So I'm also there and I can, and, and I, I don't mind hustling, even though that day I might not be being paid for as a photographer, it's still my business. And I still am you know, proud of that, want to deliver something good to the client. So I'll, I'll shoot on that day. And that's how we get, you know, nice images for the clients. And that's the thing I don't, I, I like to hustle to get good images in, and I'll keep working. And if it, if it wasn't done well one day, I'll reshoot it the next day. I think that's, uh, that's a very good way of looking at things. It shows you have uh, such a kind heart and such a good, you have the right intentions. You want to, you know, you want to give the customer, the client more than what they ask for, under promise, over deliver. And it's a really good concept to have because that's, you know, it shows your honesty. It shows how much it means to yourself as well. Um, like you just said, there, there might be days where, you know, you're not getting paid, but that's not how you're looking at it. You're looking at it. It's still my company. It's still your reputation. So you have to be able to deliver the product, you know, the project. Yeah. Um, which which actually kind of segues us nicely into the next kind of thing. You can see how I'm opening up your personal projects here and how you have the same kind of ideology and your philosophy kind of comes over to your personal projects or your personal things. Can you talk to us a little bit about this? Um, where do we start? I'm gonna I'm gonna go straight into these these images that we'll just. Wow. Yeah, it's quite different, right, than what you showed before. It's different. People don't of even course. think I'm the same. I'm the same person sometimes, you know. <laughs> so these but, are about the. Well, so this this project for me started about a year ago, and it was a point in my life. I had, I had recently turned 40 years old, and I realized through through doing a lot of commercial work through the years, you know, I started in editorial work, I got busy doing that, and then I did commercial work, and then the commercial work limited my editorial work because, you know, the news doesn't wait for anybody, but they would say, oh, Justin, can you go on a shoot tomorrow? And I would say, no, I'm booked up for my hotel shoot. So that limited my editorial work because I wasn't reliable for New York Times to call up and say, go to this country, cover this, I had to say no, and they don't like to be said no to. So, you know, I stopped mm -hmm. doing that work that I was really into in my career. I really did start with, personal project with storytelling. And I just missed that. And then I thought like, well, what's my legacy as a photographer? I love my commercial work. I love my team. I love the business that I've built, but I, I really do miss doing projects that mean something to me. I also haven't had in my commercial work, I don't have time to experiment. I don't have time to grow. Of course, I'd aim to get better in every shoot, but I don't really have time to, to play around anymore and to reinvent myself as a photographer. And one of the biggest fears I have is being complacent and being boring and being predictable. So I just thought I, I need to start this project. What's something I'm care? What's something I'm passionate about? What's something that can make a difference? Whatever that is, how big or how small. And I just realized, like, I, I love stories about. I, I, I'm drawn to people that take care of animals. You know, it's stuff that I wish I could do. I don't. I don't think I could dedicate my whole life to the, doing the things they're doing. I think I'm too narcissistic. <laughs> too too narcissist for that. But I, I, I wanted to capture these stories. And again, this is how I, why I fell in love with photography over over a decade before this, well, 15 years, I would say doing these projects, but funny enough, getting busy made me, led me away from this kind of stuff. So I was at a point in my life where I could financially say, I can do these stories. I have a good client list that I can pitch them to afterwards to help these people get the story out, but I don't care if it sells or if it doesn't. I donate the images to each organization that I shoot for or the individual that I shoot for. I let them use them how they want. I help promote, you know, and it's really changed me and it's really had a, a, a very uh, positive impact on my life. I, I feel like I'm in, I'm in love with photography again, and for me, it was always finding that balance of, you know, sh one shoot for them, one shoot for me, and as much as I, you know, I can't complain about the commercial work, this is truly where my heart is, and I really did miss doing that for 10 years, which was too long to be away from this kind of stuff. You know, I, I forgot to mention, but in between my commercial work and my editorial assignments, I also was a host of a TV show for five years that ran on History Channel, and that ate up a lot of my time, and it was fun, but wow. again, it didn't, it didn't feed my soul in the way I wanted it to, and so this was me getting back to that. This was my moment of realization. I wanted a, a project that's you know part of my legacy, something that I could say, okay, this is what I'm leaving on the world. So 
it's a project that yeah has changed my life. Uh, I plan to make a book out of it. I'm only a year into it. Now things are a little bit delayed because of what's going on with this pandemic, but I, I see it as a project that I'll probably continue to do until I die. Maybe two books, maybe three books. I don't know, but there's so many stories about people helping animals that need to be told. And I'm inspired by meeting these people. And it also gives me the freedom to you know, tell stories with my, my photography and to grow my photography and experiment with my photography. Sorry, that was long, but thank you. <laughs> That was beautiful. No, it's really good. I love how you mentioned that you're talking about all of the, the books you want to do. I mean, uh, it's like um, a photography journey, you know, volume one, two, three, because it never ends really, does it? You know, you could be doing this for so long, you'd never be able to capture it all. There's just so much of it going on everywhere. And, you know, how do you define or how do you choose what you want to cover and where you want to go and how you yeah. want to do it? Because there's animals everywhere. You know, we had the recent one in uh, Australia with the fires and stuff. And sure. so many animals were getting injured over there as well, and uh, stuff like this. I want to go back to this one for a second, but you know, the one with the rhinos. I'm sure these were the images that were pretty strong and went viral worldwide. T talking about, you know, rhinos are now becoming, or probably are. I'm not. I mean, I apologize. Correct me if I'm wrong. They're becoming extinct or are extinct. The, this is a particular uh, subspecies. It's uh, northern white rhinos. And there are subspecies of white rhinos. So there's only two northern white rhinos left in the world. So this is the story about these two northern white rhinos. They're both female. There is still a process that they're trying to save them through artificial insemination. It's, they're working on that. I've covered that as well. Um, it's a long shot. You know, in American, America, they call it like a Hail Mary. <laughs> you know, uh, um, yeah. it's, it's difficult. It won't be a, you know, pure breed of a northern white, white rhino. But yeah, it's, it's a loss of habitat and it's, it's uh, the consumption side, obviously, for medicinal purposes, which, you know, to note, it doesn't actually have any medicinal yeah, purposes yeah. at all. No, it's, it's, you know, hair and nails, keratin. So I've, I've lived in Vietnam. I've covered the consumption side. And yeah, it's a sad, sad story. And, you know, it was quite a, a powerful moment for me to be there to see the two rhinos. And it was, you know, kind of a, a crappy moment, you know, thinking about humanity and what we've done. And then also to see to see the rangers that risk their lives to, you know, to take care of not just these northern white rhinos, but all of the animals at the conservation to protect them from poachers. You know, a couple of the guys that you've shown in these pictures, one of them actually had to, he killed, killed three poachers who fired upon him and his, and his uh, security detail. I mean, they're um, the rangers, they fired upon them and they, they killed three of these guys, you know, and this is the kind of stuff that happens, not, not this is in Kenya, but it happens all throughout Africa. It happens in other parts of the world. And I wanted to sort of humanize, um, humanize these people. Cause I think there's a lot of people in Asia, this story has been done by a lot of, a lot of amazing photographers. But for me, it was like, listen, I live in Vietnam. They're, they're, they're one of the biggest consumers, Vietnam and China. And I, if people don't care about animals. Maybe they'll care about these people. And it's different too. What I like, what I, I'm excited about my project and the funny part about my project is I'm not a wildlife photographer. I don't have a bunch of long lenses. I, I now shoot with, uh, this whole project is shot with a Leica and a 35 millimeter. Occasionally I'll use a 75 and a 135, but I, I, I photograph stories where I can ethically get close to animals where it makes sense. In this case, these rhinos are not wild. So we are getting close. I always need to clear that up, but, and people that have that bond, if the story of people helping animals, they don't get close. It doesn't work for my story. I really need to capture these intimate moments. So each chapter is its own story in itself, but I'm, I'm aiming to build this collective project to show these intimate moments and this bond that these people have around the world that dedicate their lives to helping, to helping animals. That's, uh, that's amazing is that one. Um, I love how you said where you, you, you're not a wildlife photographer, but because uh, it doesn't work in your lifestyle. I think you can see from the images themselves, they're not, I mean, yes, they have wildlife in them, but you can tell how you've uh, captured, the way you've captured them is very, in a, in a very documentary manner and very, you know, newsworthy, obviously. It really makes you want to look and engage and understand it. You're not just saying, oh, there's a nice rhino in the distance, you know, with the sunset. Yeah. You, you, know, you, you wonder, you know, what's actually going on, what's happening over here. And the way you've gotten so close up to it with your choice of equipment, you can see all the detail and the texture and the skins. And, you know, you can see the love between, just there, you know, the rhino doesn't feel threatened or scared. Um, neither does the, uh, how to call him, the owner or the, the, the carer for him. And it's so, it's so loving and so beautiful. And that's not something you'll be able to capture from a wildlife perspective because you're not going to get that sort of a effect, are you? And it just works really, really well. Um, coming on to this last, the last few bits is um, 
with COVID, what do you, obviously we're all now restricted and there's nothing which we can do in terms of movement and you get a lot of photographers right now who are feeling a lot of, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not really motivated and a lot of them are losing kind of like hope in sense of what they're going to do and what's going to happen in the next yeah. year and what's going to what's going to happen what kind of advice can you give to people who are like this at home you know who are thinking what to do next or how do we get inspired get the mojo back yeah it's a great question and I, and I feel the struggle and I've gone through it too but I think any photographer goes through that in their in their career especially early on when things aren't as busy you have to know how to fill that downtime and you have to figure out how to you know that's where you build the infrastructure of your business that's where you pay attention to you know your marketing with your website edit things like that but I would say you know, during these times, the best advice I could give is, you know, first get organized, get everything on the back end of your business organized, treat yourself like a business. A lot of photographers that even, even if you just do documentary work, you have to make money, you have to sell prints or you have to understand your rate. So have a system for that, understand a system for that. You know, now, now is a great time for any photographer that complains about, you know, if they didn't know how to use lighting and they want to use, learn how to use lighting, now's the time to do it with YouTube. Um, mm -hmm. What I would stress to people, which is, you know, important to me, I wish, you know, you know, for me, I, I took 10 years to do, do a personal project again. So take some time and clear your head and actually think, what, what's a project you can start and go out and shoot it? Now is a perfect time to do that, even if you're you know, locked in your house, but as countries open up, there's a project you can shoot there. There's a way you can experiment with light, like pick up your camera and go shoot something, self-portraits, whatever you need to do, but start to formulate a plan for a project because personal projects, honestly, like my personal project that I first did when I moved to Vietnam about victims in Agent Orange, the skills that I learned during that project by experimenting my photography extended into my wedding work, extended into my commercial work, and, and it, it, it made me grow as a photographer. Everything I do has a storytelling element to it. My mm -hmm. hotel work, there's a story there. My wedding work, there's a story there. And you know, now I'm back into my documentary work, which obviously there's a story there. So that it's, it's important is just to get the reps in, get the practice like anything else. Find a project now is the time to plan your personal project and to start to shoot it. Because a lot of people will complain about, you know, oh, well, I didn't, I don't have time to do a personal project because this assignment, well, there's no excuse now. You might not be able to travel to some exotic location like myself going to photograph the rhinos, but you don't have to. There's a project there. You could do something on your family. You could just experiment with the, with the way you shoot and you'll grow because when you're, when you're shooting paid work, you do not have time to grow. You don't. You have to shoot what the client expects you to shoot. So there's very little time to try anything else new in your career. It took me 10 years. Now's the perfect time for people, you know, to, to start yeah. something new and something fresh. And it's good I mean, to just, now's a great time to reflect, you know, reflect on your work, go back and look through it. I think there's something to be said to see, what did you shoot five years ago? What did you shoot a year ago? If you knew in photography, have you grown? Are you doing the same shots? Are you seeing some repetition in your work? And then also mm -hmm. look at how do you compare against other people? Hold yourself to the standard that you want to get to. You know, if you want to compete globally, hold yourself to the global photographers who are doing that kind of work, you know, so getting or getting the kind of work that you want to get. It's, it's a great time now to actually reflect. Well, Justin, thank you so much. Um, just what you just said there with global ones. I mean, you are a great inspiration. Uh, I really do hope people can see that and really do get inspired by a lot of your work. Um, we can see how your, your style does work, you know, um, throughout continuously throughout all of your work you know through your hotels through everything that you're doing you can you can probably see some similarities in all of them um so guys do please check his work out he's uh, he's definitely an inspiration for all of us so thank you so much for your time we really really do appreciate you joining us today azim do you have any more questions you want to uh, ask no i don't have any questions uh, first of all thank you justin and it's great to thank see you guys, guys again after the after yeah, the show in Pakistan, you held in Pakistan. <laughs> so thank you, Ranveer, for asking. If the audience you knows about animal stories in Pakistan, hit me up on email or on Instagram at askma and tell me I want to come to Pakistan for a great animal story. So if you know a person who's doing wonderful things for animals, tell me I'll be on a flight there when I can travel. <laughs> wow, See, that's that's a really good, good way about that's it. That's a great that's a great message for Pakistan I'm over there. So guys, for Pakistan, if you're listening, you just you heard it here first. Just stands ready. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm almost ready. He's ready. So thank you both of you. Thank you, Runway, for asking great questions. And thank you, Justin, for coming here. Thanks. Thanks for letting me share my work and my stories. I appreciate that. Thank you. Awesome. See you soon. Thank you. All right, bye See guys. you soon. Thank you. Stay in touch. Bye. Goodbye.